Here we are. So we are reading Marcus Aurelius's meditation. We're on book seven. Completing book seven. One of the things that someone who maybe isn't familiar with stoicism would ask is, well, what's the goal of this idea? What's the goal of stoicism? And it's uh, it's kind of an open-ended question. Indeed, there's such a, a double movement at play when the stoic thinks about the goal, because a goal has this implication of an outward movement, but so much of Stoic teaching deals with inward resolve. And so you get a double movement of before you target your goal, you must have the right mind. Um, and not a mind full of facts or details, but almost a mind cleared of um, extraneous detail and above all emotions, the pathos, so that you don't get blown away or tend to drift the second you take a step towards the goal. You know, that's a new term that's come up, uh, pathos. We've talked to quite a bit about logos. Uh, could you describe the pathos a little bit more? From my understanding of it, um, what characterizes a stoic, like a, a cold-blooded stoic, is apathy. And that can have a negative connotation of a person at a funeral doesn't shed a tear, even if that person is their mother or father. But a positive connotation might be a person who does not privilege their emotions, because pathos is just the Greek word for your emotion, um, doesn't privilege the emotion above, let's say, a rational, calculated kind of, to use Rugmo's term in past discussions, to put an accidental individual emotion that just has to do with one person, to privilege that over the intelligence of the universe. Like there's a lot going on when someone dies, a lot more than just that person dying. And I'm not saying outside that person's death, but it's almost as if that person's death had a reason. And so in that sense, a stoic who has apathy can get a bad rap in today's society. Because when someone says, well, someone died for a reason, the Stoic is thinking they also laughed and had a good life for a reason. So they're using reason indiscriminately. And there's also this dichotomy between apathy and nihilism. Um, what do you mean? Well, so with apathy, you are not allowing yourself to be moved by those uh, emotions, the pathos. And nihilism, I feel that is almost an act of turning away from your emotion and saying no to them, that they're a bad thing, not letting yourself feel them, whereas the apathetic person allows themselves to feel their emotion and those emotions, knowing that the emotion will eventually dissipate. Uh, just like uh, when Marcus here, in numerous times in the book, he's talked about that nothing lasts forever. This idea of impermanence, everything is going to come into existence and then leave existence, including your emotions, including your physical body, including everything around you, like the symbols that, that surround us. They're all going to come and go. The problem we run into is when we get entangled with the emotion or with symbol when we grasp onto them. And I've noticed a lot of parallels between what Marcus Aurelius has been talking about and what I've read in other books regarding Buddhism and Zen practice. And the topic of this book, I mean, the title of it is Meditation, um, the main practice of uh, Zen and Buddhism is in itself uh, meditation, which I guess if we... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, if we wanted to define what uh, meditation is, it's kind of like, and also maybe a brief definition of the goal of this idea of stoicism is the focusing on a path of choosing wisely and training to de-escalate aggression. 
and learning to stay present. Uh, we do this by taking a moment and pausing very briefly throughout the day in an effortless way where we can just have a few seconds of being right here. That's such a great point on meditation and as it relates to the apathetic discussion because we can never escape the tyranny of the present. And I'm, I don't know if anyone can relate, but life is full of decisions. And when you make those decisions, you feel that the decision you're making at the time is the correct one. Uh, you have positive emotion about it. You've, you thought you thought it through, you deliberated, and then you make the decision. And then you wake up the next day and either the entire world and its logical rules have changed or you have changed and you no longer feel good about the decision. You have regrets. And then that day is spent going over what you've made in the past and almost trying to erase it, to reestablish a sense of positive emotion or to readjust your mind to a more logical way of thinking. And that cycle just repeats itself. And so it's so easy to go to the symbols that are external. Um, to put it in contemporary cast, politics, it's so easy to go to a certain party, one of two, and allow that symbol to wash over you. Because it seems like those things last. Those things don't wake up in a day and regret everything they did the following day or the day before. But in the one sense, to use your use of meditation, it's in a sense illusory to follow those symbols because those symbols do experience internal change. The Republican Party today is not the same it was a year or two years ago, and so also with the Democratic Party. A college education is not the same today as it was 10 years ago, people can say, and things like that. And all of those things prove true. Healthcare changes. Everything not, changes. <laughs> not only do they change externally in an objective way, but the way people subjectively understand what a symbol is, is constantly changing them. So, for example, uh, everyone could say that they know what a mother is. That your mother is a symbol. But what your idea of what your mother is is not necessarily the true essence of that person. You can't confine them just to whatever your symbol of them uh, is constructed as. Thank God. What? Yeah, thank God. <laughs> so one of the things I love about reading, um, we're kind of reading this book relatively slowly, one book per week. And what I like doing, um, what I like about reading this slowly is really taking the time to absorb the material, not aggressively reading through each page, trying to get from the beginning to the end so we can move on to the next book. So in a way, we're a pro by reading each book one per week, the, each book is about 30 pages, where we're giving ourselves time to really absorb it. We finish the book, and one day, the next day, you can reread it. Uh, maybe gleam a, a new understanding from it. And you might have time then, because you're not reading so aggressively, to pick up another book. And so recently I picked up uh, Prometheus Rising by Robert Anton Wilson. And I got to the first chapter of that through the first chapter. And he referenced Timothy Leary uh, at least twice. Uh, one of the ideas is the various five to six model circuit of consciousness. And after reading through that, then I stumbled upon a YouTube lecture series uh, that Timothy Leary did in 66. I posted that in the Discord philosophy. Highly recommend it. And after listening to that, it brought me right back to the book that we're currently reading, Meditation, I, I picked up on quite a few of the stoic ideas that Timothy Leary recapitulated. Uh, and one of those is our addictions to symbols. And that I love because it's a paradox. 
our addiction to symbols, and yet we're talking about a book, and then we're talking about cultural figures, Dennis Leary, for example, or Timothy Leary, excuse me. And it, it does have this smattering of the paradox. I mean, certainly ironic use of the paradox, but that still lingers as a, a layer below the layer below the layer of the question. Uh, can we ever, in other words, to pose it as a question mark, can we ever get out of the symbol? Are we doomed to live within the symbolic world, not reality? Sort of look at it at one way and not in many different ways. Or what does the many way does the many way conception belie the maze that we're stuck in? Namely, one symbol refers to another, refers to another, refers to another, refers to another, and there's no end to the reference. I think you're right. There is no end to it. Uh, however, we can implement these practices of stoicism, such as meditation. For example, looking to the divinity within ourselves instead of looking externally for the divinity and symbols. And that's something we talked about on Thursday, the idea of the stoic idea of, of finding divinity within ourselves as opposed to finding it in other people or other ideas or other symbols. And one of the, one of the practices in, in Buddhism to do that is meditating. So you allow your ideas, which are formed by symbols, uh, to pass through your mind and you become non-attached to them. You let them pass through your mind as if they were a cloud. They come in, they dissipate. You know, the way clouds work is one molecule of water enters the cloud, it condenses, and on the other opposite side of the cloud, a molecule is leaving it. So it, all the time, it's fluxing in and out of existence. And one of the methods that Timothy Leary was a huge proponent of was using entheogenic uh, molecules to change our perception of the symbols that we're addicted to, uh, particularly LSD and a number of other drugs. He just, he hit on LSD mainly because he thought it was a very useful compound as opposed to other drugs like caffeine or alcohol, which have been around uh, for a much longer period of time. LSD is relatively uh, recent synthesis. And what that does in his view is it breaks down the barriers between symbols and so we can experience um, either a world where they don't exist or where a conglomeration of symbols exists in and forms a new meaning for for what we may have uh, previously attached uh, a label to that symbol and this kind of brought about a question I had in mind. So this idea of looking inward to the, the divinity within you, uh, when Marcus Aurelius was having these meditations, would this have been considered a revolutionary idea? I mean, in terms of Christianity, I think that would, it would have been considered uh, maybe heretical to look to the God within. Uh, as opposed to looking to a priest. I think he, uh, I think in a way he made this, this book of meditations for himself to substitute what the Bible would be good for. Just substituted his, his own writings like the divinity within for the Bible, which is like the divinity from above if that makes sense. Like the divinity from the Logos, maybe? We're at a very deep level here with that question, to my mind, because it seems as if there are two keys. So you have a given structure. It doesn't have to be brick and mortar. It can be a paradigm, conceptual structure, like Christianity, for example. It could be communism, whatever. Name the thing. Well, there are a number of ways, actually, there's really one or two ways into those structures, and you need the key. 
And the thing about keys are they're built for the structure. So by using that key to enter in, you're only doing what the structure commands. But then there's the second kind of key to get inside a structure. And maybe hip people in a literary circle would call that subversive interpretations of a text. And then that second kind of key gets you in the structure, but gets you in the structure as a stranger, as someone who doesn't actually belong there or have a house in it. And maybe writing the way he was so autobiographically while giving a history of theology constituted his subversive gesture, was his second kind of key. And so too with Timothy Leary, perhaps the LSD experience was like a trope or a meme as the second kind of key to get into a, a second kind of psychoanalytic um, approach to what it means to be a human being or what it meant to be an American at that time or a human at that time, his whole idea or his famous saying was tune in, turn off, tune in and drop out. So the tuning in part was taking these molecules like LSD or psilocybin uh, to tune into a reality structure, to tune into a divinity within us that we otherwise don't necessarily have the key to when we're not in the uh, meditative uh, state of mind. And I want to go meta with it as well. There's a sense in which those molecules could be non-synthetic structures. They could be books. They could be, who knows, um, a, a mode of virtual reality. They could be going by a river and fishing. They could be a walk in the park. Like, because really, at the base, it seems as if LSD and things like that, molecules, molecular language, is like a springboard or a kick at the door to get us into a kind of modality, to use a Ter Terence McKenna phraseology, a modality of perception that allows you to see a rose as something other than an organic expression of uh, a bunch of cells and bonds and thermonu thermonuclear forces. It's something beautiful. It stands for love. Um, it stands for heartbreak, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And all these things it actually doesn't refer to. But because you've dissolved the boundaries, you've stepped into a different modality, you get to see these things as items on a different menu. And books like yeah. a, a novel, for me, a novel does that in spades. Like you get to sit with this thing that is, on the surface of things, your native language. You understand the language. But as you're reading and as time goes by and as pages turn, it becomes a world, but also a world referring to itself into other worlds, and so it gets to critique other worlds. You really get this meta thing out of books and, by extension, molecules and things like that. You know, something I've been finding interesting while reading this book is it was written, written around 165 AD. And I'm not sure if Christianity had really uh, developed at that. So it might not have been for another two to 300 years that the ideas of looking within for your own divinity uh, became uh, an, a heretical action. It's funny, last night I was uh, reading a couple pages in the Gospel of John, and I was just doing it out of pure curiosity to see 21st century eyes would see something that maybe when I was 19 or um, if I could imagine myself 100 years ago, would not have picked up on. And it was the part where this Jesus figure is walking with his disciples. He's on his way to his goal, which for him was a torture instrument two pieces of wood that would kill him. Uh, but for him, it meant a lot more than that. It was an aspirational thing to save humanity at large. But anyway, he was walking with these disciples, these people, these young people that were following him around. And he said that he was going ahead to come back in a different form. And at the beginning of that book, it caused me to remember the beginning of that book, there's this discussion of the logo. And I thought of it in those terms, like a brand logo and a theology. Uh, 
God, wherever God is in the, at the beginning of time, and that these two things were together. It didn't say that they were one or unified, but they were with one another at the very beginning in prehistory. The idea of the logo, of a, of a thing, a symbol standing for something other than itself, and this inherently valuable thing, namely God. And so to see a human being making those gestures and those movements and almost making a symbol out of a symbol, a piece of wood becoming the uh, throne room of the savior of the world, kind of, kind of like goes after that idea of the logo being with the God. And somehow that might relate to the God within. I don't know how, but it's kind of like a trinity. Those three ideas. I keep wondering, like, what um, what other people in history have really been influenced by this particular book? Uh, I know we mentioned in another discussion that uh, Mohatma, not not Gandhi, I'm sorry, uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, one person that read this book while he was in prison, and it helped him overcome his tent. Uh, passionate anger and aversion to people who imprisoned him. After reading this book, he he decided to transform that anger or transcend it. He wow, he changed our country. That changed our whole country. Yeah, so this I'm book had a Africa. huge impact. This book had a huge impact on that. Oh, um, wow. If he, if he had not read this book while he was in prison, he oh, may have my been fuck. A, I might not even be here. Person. That's pretty oh, crazy, shit. eh? <laughs> yeah. There's a couple other people that have apparently read this book. Uh, let's see. Bill Clinton apparently reads it every year. Was this before uh, Alexander the Great? Or, af- or after? Before or after Alexander the Great? The book. Because I re- yeah, Meditations. Because I, I think I recalled something about him uh, reading a book every night before he would conquer these these lands or something like that. Alexander, the, was... Alexander the Great was born in 356 BC before, the, before been... Marcus came along. Okay. It was definitely before and uh, there were a, a number of other uh, Stoic philosophers that uh, came before uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, one of them was Stoicism uh, originated in like 300 BC, I think, something around there. Yeah. So the other, um, the, the three best known ones are Marcus Aurelius was kind of the last uh, Stoic of the the early. Of the Roman Empire, and before him came uh, Epictetus and Seneca. Epictetus, did I say that wrong? No, it sounds like you got it right. Epictetus. Uh, he was a, a slave who triumphed and became an influential lecturer and a uh, friend of Hadrian, uh, who was a, a very powerful emperor. Apparently, Ralph Waldo Enders, uh, Emerson uh, was a big fan of this book, Meditation. And there was a, a link I posted to a journal article in the book club room. I'm trying to find that particular uh, PDF document. So if anyone has access to like JSTOR or an academic uh, search database, um, you could help me get that. I would really appreciate it. But uh, there's another book that deals with this uh, topic of Stoicism that Joe Madden, the uh, Chicago Club's director, and uh, Michael Lombardi uh, are huge fans of. It's called The Obstacle is the Way. Have you guys heard of that one? No. It's uh, written by Ryan Holiday. It's called The Obstacle is the Way, The Timeless Art of Turning Trials into Trials. I haven't read it yet, um, but maybe it's something we should put on our official uh, reading. Do you have the power of now on there, on your list? The Eckhart Tolle, the power of mm. now. Yes, uh, I'm waiting I for Eckhart to think... 
We don't have it currently. Are you a big fan of that one? Yes, that's my favorite book ever. What is it? It changed my it? It, it changed my life um, a lot, but I believed in it too much. I gave it a bit too much trust, and I ended up in a position. I don't know if, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't go through all the shit I went through. So sometimes you can trust an idea from a book and it brings a lot of pain. But I love that book. I actually read it on my YouTube page. I haven't continued with the process of doing that, but I would love to continue. It, it's also all about being present. Have you read it? I've read parts of it. I've had I've struggled through reading it uh, only because oh. the style of writing is uh, uh, the Q and A style. That oh. it, it just felt a bit mechanical, uh, but he uh, does hit on a lot of really good points, which are uh, it's a recapitulation of these stoic ideas of being present looking within and letting the fountain of good rise up within you. Uh, yeah, and not emitting negative frequencies so you don't attract them. Also that you invite less negativity into your environment. And he also has an idea, which I love, um, which is if you're in a position where you, you don't like what's happening and it's making you upset, it's making you stress and you hate it, you feel like you hate it and you're frustrated, do one of three things. Either accept it fully, change it or stop it. And only with one of those three choices do you, will you get peace. So, and a lot of people sit stuck in a position where they are so frustrated and they do ne none of those three things. They don't accept it fully and work with it. They don't do anything to change it. They complain about it. And they don't stop it. They don't leave. And those, those three options have carried me through life ever since I picked up on them. I always... That's part of why I left an abusive marriage, because I knew I had to stop it. There was no changing it, and there was no accepting it. And it was very painful. Yeah, this idea of um, being in the present moment, uh, so uh, particularly in the Buddhist teachings, it said that the root of our discomfort is self-absorption, which could be uh, translated as delusion or ego. Um, our fear of being present, so that can be translated as aversion. So this idea of being in the present moment um, is a very integral part of Buddhism and Stoicism alike. Um, it's not so easy as it sounds. So if you ever try to just sit and meditate, you'll quickly notice that you're going to have thoughts coming into your head it's very easy to get attached to those thoughts, tangled into those thoughts. And you can sit for 20, 30, 60 minutes and not actually experience the present moment because you're getting thought. And then another aspect of uh, Buddhism particularly is these ideas of the, the roots of suffering. They call them the three roots of suffering. That's uh, desire and attached to physical and sensual pleasures. Uh, but the other two are self-absorption, which could be thought of as delusion or ego, and this idea of fear of being present. So that's often referred to as aversion. And aversion has many synonyms, which range from uh, anxiety and anxiousness to uneasiness and worry. There's, there's probably 25 different synonyms that could describe aversion. And that's just um, wanting to turn away from some, uh, whether that's a thought or a feeling within yourself, running away from that, or an external experience. Maybe you walk upon somebody that's smoking a cigarette and all of a sudden of the symbol of cigarettes is something that's disgusting that you don't like. So you automatically attach to that person smoking the cigarette the symbol of disgust. And so they feel uh, a fear uh, 
fear being present around them or an aversion to them. It's kind of similar to reading the willpower instinct and one small change can change your life or one small step can change your life, the Kaizen method. In, it's, in the willpower instinct, the author talks about how it's really hard to gain self-control when you want to do something differently. And in that way, trying to avoid temptation is, uh, it's really difficult to let go at first, but in order to gain self-control, you have to be able to look at the temptation fully uh, by taking out a small chunk of it. So for example, if you are trying to give up smoking, uh, one thing you can do is reduce one cigarette from your average amount of cigarettes that you smoke in a day. Say like you smoke 15 a day. And then you try to reduce one cigarette a day and you smoke 14. And then when you gradually lower that amount, you'll eventually find yourself looking at the pack of cigarettes and you tell yourself, let's see if I can increase the amount of cigarettes. Now, as paradoxical as that sounds, it actually works sometimes because when you try to increase the amount of cigarettes that you try to smoke, you'll eventually get disgusted by it and then you'll want to reduce the amount of smoking as possible and th the same thing can be said when you are trying to focus on another project uh, an important task that you want to do and when your anxiety builds up the best thing you can do is to sit down for a minute or two concentrate on the breath and then you can eventually get back to that important project in the Kaizen method, uh, it's kind of the same way, although you are looking for ways to eliminate waste by taking one small chunk at a time, working on one small chunk at a time, and then, and then just gradually adding more chunks to this change that you want to have in your life, this positive change that you want, even though temptation is pulling you aside and grabbing you, and you feel somewhat anxious at the process of doing something positive, like trying to learn a new language, even though it looks kind of daunting. But just simply sitting there, sitting for like one minute, learning a, a word or something, and then telling your brain different questions, like very creative questions, like, is there a way that I can make this more fun? It's almost like a quiz show in a way where the host asks really complex questions and you're trying to figure out, your brain is trying to tempt you into finding what the answer might be. And eventually, over time, you'll want to be able to engage in this sort of positivity, this form of Kaizen. Where do those answers come from? any different ways. Um, it mostly just comes from the form of creativity of how you actually see those que see those answers, really. Hmm. And every person sees it differently than every other person. We all see it in a unique way. So it Still comes going. from a different place, maybe, for everyone. Or it feels like it. I don't know. Maybe everyone has their own um, idea of what freedom is to overcome uh, attachment. So if we're using like a, a smoking addictions, for example, or if I could introduce another idea, of, let's say you have a uh, poison ivy um, on your skin, so you have an itch, and it's, it's not something that is, uh, it's, our, it's not our habit to not want to itch that itch. Uh, we want to itch it. It's like we have this child mind or an, a monkey mind that wants to just itch that itch, but doing so is going to make it more intense, going to aggravate things. And so in order to make things better, we have to just sit with it, knowing that that pain 
or this in case, in this case, the itch is going to eventually pass. As Marcus Aurelius says, all things are going to pass. They come into existence. They eventually go out of existence. Just like pain, just like any thought or attachment that you would have, it's going to come and go, but you just have to give it space. Going mm. back to the original question we started here, like what is the goal of Stoicism? Um, one thing I wrote down in my notes was that it's seeking to build your own character. And in, in book seven, uh, Marcus mentions that the mind has no needs except those that it creates on its own. So we have this aspect of wanting to become attached to material things. But seeking to build your own character, I feel, means that those material things are going to be taken away from you uh, either during your life or at the moment when you drop your body and move on out of this plane of existence. So important aspects, I feel, are to cultivate things that cannot be taken away from you, um, such as kindness and honesty, diligence, integrity. Uh, and self-respect or respect for others. Uh, those are things that will stay with you if you give them the space to and don't become tangled with the material world. You let them grow over time. Yeah, you have to let them grow. You have to cultivate them like they're a garden, uh, if we could use that metaphor. I call it conditioning. Okay, yeah. I like that. So we got to condition <laughs> ourselves towards peace and happiness to ourselves first and then we can have that peace and happiness towards others uh, conditioning for contentness and tranquility uh, conditioning ourselves for the love of mankind even if people do stupid things if we see the person as a stupid person that's going to uh, that's going to inhibit our love for mankind in general. Condition yourself to see past the stupidity. So, yes, so, so to see past the stupidity of the person and maybe view it as stupid action. So, like, we have a lot of people in prison, right, that maybe they've done stupid things. But that doesn't mean that we can't still show a person that's done a stupid thing uh, love and compassion. Um, and then yeah. this last idea of cultivating the, uh, cultivating the love for mankind, I think follows into or ties into this idea of following the idea of God or following, um, the logos. Acting as if God exists. <laughs> yeah. Acting as if God exists and you know, I noticed that Jordan Peterson um, mm -hmm. mentions quite a few things that Timothy Leary mentioned. And in turn, Timothy Leary mentions a lot of things that Marcus Aurelius mentioned. I found that quite interesting. Like here in book seven, uh, he very specifically men mentions standing erect. Uh, you know, having self-respect, and that's one of the, I think, the that's first rule rules number of, one, dude. Rule number one. Stand up straight one. with your shoulders that. back. I love it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, there's a few other quotes here in book seven that I wanted to try to go over. Uh, one of which was, very little is necessary to live a happy life. So as long as you are taking care of your basic necessities, you can become unattached to material things so long as you take care of those basic necessities and you can experience happiness. And we know that people who have a lot of material attachment, let's say Kanye West, or let's say uh, famous people who have quite a bit of money, they still fall into the entrapments of, of materialism and wanting more and more um, and they're not necessarily happy and then we can look at people who have very little and we find that they might be some of the happiest people on the planet i'm happier now than i've ever been in my life and i just i just came from homelessness 
from starting over with nothing at 29 years old. And I've never been so grateful in my life. Every day I'm so grateful that I have a roof over my head and that I'm not going hungry and that I have some work to do. So that applies to me so hard right now. That's good. I'm proud for you. Proud of you. <laughs> Thanks. And it was really difficult leaving. Um, there was a lot of darkness. There was a lot of shame. And I still, I still have damage to my self-esteem now subconsciously. Um, but the authentic uh, gratefulness is massive. Well, you know what yes. that reminds me of is uh, lotus plants, the lotus flower. They grow out of the mud. They need the murkiness. <laughs> they need uh, the just the the silky mud of uh, of yuckiness to to grow and become a bo- a beautiful flower on top of the water. They need to experience the darkness before they realize how how bright it can get. Oh yeah, exactly. I was kind of the same way when I um, was going through the self-authoring suite and how I was able to do a lot more writing because whenever I would have these really dark thoughts, these really dark ideas, and I had a really, really had a hard time trying to let go of this suppression inside of me, I would always write it down. And now through writing it's it's therapeutic to me just letting it all out and then once all this dark stuff is out there's a huge weight lifted off of me and i feel better afterwards i like that you know like the the question is i heard a little child ask once what do i do when i experience anger do i suppress it do i let it out on the other person that i'm angry at and their response uh, was, you care for that anger as if it were your baby. You carry it, you show it compassion. Eventually, the anger will transform into something else. If you suppress it, if you let it out, just let it scream, it's only going to grow stronger. Yes, so this ties in a lot with what Eckhart Tolle says. He says that um, witnessing it, without judgment, letting it be and take its course within you, feeling it, acknowledging it, being present in that, that is a way that we can condition darkness out of ourselves. I put it a little in my own words there at the end as well, but that's the idea. No, that's that's a great way to put it. And it kind of ties back into this idea of symbols, which are related to judgment. So. When you're having a judgment of somebody else or, or yourself, you're first attaching a symbol to that external entity or a symbol to yourself that you uh, are maybe an addict or maybe um, that person is a, a villain, for example. And the second you attach that symbol to them, you're going to simultaneously have a judgment uh, of the symbol, whether you like it or you don't like it. Uh, This other quote that I like um, from book seven was, don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you do have. Yep, and and imagine that you don't have it. I think it was something you put in there too. Like imagine a world where where you don't have what you have so that you can appreciate what you do have. I have too much. How about that? Yeah, we all definitely, in in modern society, we have more than the basic necessities. There's really only a few things that we need. Very little is needed, I think. That was one of the things he mentioned. I have things in the garage projects that are lingering that cause anxiety when I think about them. But they're unimportant, ultimately. It causes you anxiety. So what Eckhart Tolle would have, for example, said is, either accept it fully, so that the anxiety goes away, change it, or stop it. So by changing it, you would work on it. By stopping it, burn it down, do something. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's time to throw some of that shit away. You'll feel so much better. Yeah, like feng shui. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, like, if you haven't used it in the last two years, maybe you don't need it. Garage sale time. Correct. <laughs> Spring cleaning. <laughs> or better yet, <laughs> better yet, you can ask the material that you have in your garage if <laughs> whether or not it has given you joy in life. And if not, just toss it out. Yeah. But what if you're a hoarder and you got joy from it long ago? And it's killing you now because you're hoarding too much. Yeah. Just got to let the past go sometimes. Yeah, those well, hoarders. I've done a little bit of that. It's, it, it's actually easier than, than, you, than the initial, you know, thought. Or maybe uh, it's like uh, making your bed. You know, you, yeah. first thing you wake up and you do in the morning, you make your bed. And that's like one task you've completed and it makes the ne next task easier to approach because you already completed one, you can move on to the next. And so if yep. you're a hoarder, maybe throwing out the first thing will lead to throwing out the next thing. Or in Slarty's case, doubling down and, or ask yourself, do you want to still finish those projects? If you don't, just give it away to someone else who can use it maybe. Oh, burn it. Burning stuff is fun. <laughs> so uh, we have a couple minutes left. The one last thing I wanted to mention about stoicism is this idea of mental stability. Um, I think it's brought up a couple times, maybe not directly labeled as mental stability, but uh, the idea of just being present with the mind, sitting with the mind. And I, I'm thinking of an example or a simile of the mind as either a thunderstorm where you have a torrent of mental activity and maybe you identify as the thunderstorm itself and then everything you see from your perspective becomes influenced by that. Everything looks like it's uh, turbulent. Everything looks like it's menacing and dark versus the idea of the mind as the, the clear sky above the thunderstorm. Or, and if you can have this clear mind, your perspective of the world becomes uh, clear and uninhibited. You don't attach the labels of menacing to things. Uh, I'm sure you guys have experienced when you're angry, everything feels like it's against you or you're angry at everything. Or everything if you sucks. feel... Yeah, every, let's, say you, let's say you feel like everything sucks this very moment. The next thought you're going to have is everything is going to suck for the, next, the rest of this day. That might progress to everything is going to suck for the week, maybe the whole year, maybe the rest of my life is going to suck. Um, and, this, and the ideas in stoicism are that you no know, things are going to pass. Um, even if they're sucky in this moment, they might not be so bad or turbulent in the next moment. So this idea of mental stability is um, not identifying yourself with the thought, but identifying as the observer of the thought. And yeah. I know that's something Akira the Dawn has talked quite a bit about. And it really feels like he's taken quite a bit of his perspective on life from these stoic ideas. You know, because we, I think it's something that was mentioned in one of the general chats on the Discord is even if it's raining, you can rest assured that the sky above is clear, the sun is still shining. So you don't have to be oppressed by the, the conditions of the environment or the current conditions of your mind. The moon and stars are still there. The water that's fallen down has always been on the planet, so... Just let it you can all kind go. Of it. You can kind of sense it in his music as well. Absolutely. Did you guys get to listen to the biblical series uh, live premiere yesterday? No, I haven't yet. I only watched the beginning of it. In there for a little bit. I'm still eating beets. <laughs> <laughs> for now. That one was hilarious. I, I need a few days. <laughs> I actually started watching The Office today because of it. 
Oh, oh my god, that show's show hilarious. <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful. Were there any when you other... when you watch it when you when you watch that show, try to imagine that uh that Dunder Mifflin is Michael Scott and every and all the characters inside are just voices in his head. That's how I do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Take a while, look at <laughs> he looks crazy so, enough. Uh, were there any other quotes from this book or quotes from other books or other wanted to briefly mention before we wrap up this session? Any like any other books you guys are currently reading besides meditation? I started Crime and Punishment by Fedor Dostoevsky. I'm still not that far into it yet. Just about chapter five. It's kind of depressing. That one is. <laughs> It is. Yeah, it gets um, dark. That one's on Jordan Peterson's reading list. It, it yeah, he good. talks about it. He talks about it all the time. I think the the main idea that he brings to that book or his perspective is that if you do something against the higher power, for example, uh, in this case, uh, he's interjecting the higher power as the law. Um, that you're going to experience negative physical emotion because that's built into the uh, ancient structure of our limbics. So if you violate a law that you know to be right, you're going to experience negative uh, outcome. And that's going to manifest as uh, physical ailments. It's going to manifest maybe as depression. So you have to really pay attention to how you're feeling and use that as a map to guide you maybe to the, the correct path. Yeah, I feel like uh, the main character here, Raskolnikov, definitely could have used a copy of Meditations for himself. He visits some, so... he visits some dark places so far. I've only read four chapters. Well, yeah, one of the questions he asked is, and this was mentioned even in the uh, biblical series number four that we listened to, uh, well, that Akira premiered yesterday, was why not break a law if you know you're not going to get caught? It's something a child will ask. Why shouldn't I lie, cheat, or steal if I know I can get ahead and I know I'm not going to get caught? Why shouldn't I do it? And the maybe the superficial or the first answer to that question would be, well, you wouldn't want to do it because you wouldn't want other people to do it to you. But what Jordan Peterson is hinting at, and particularly in relation to this book, Crime and Punishment, is you don't break the law. You don't do immoral acts because it weakens. It makes you feel bad. And once you start feeling bad, you can become sick. And once you get entrapped in that, uh, those dark emotions, it can be hard to get back out. Yeah. I think the words he uses specifically is doing the wrong thing destabilizes you over time. And if it destabilizes you and if you are a part of a system, it destabilizes the entire system. And it brings you out of alignment. So good. It's been... 60 minutes we typically meet up for an hour and try to be as uh, succinct as possible and direct as possible uh, in these hours um, it's kind of our hour of meditation to bring what our insights were from the book or from other aspects of life um, so next week by next thursday the goal is to try to get through book eight of meditations and of course, if you're reading other uh, books on the side, you can bring insights from those books to the book club meeting. Uh, or, or even post stuff in the Discord. Um, like I've posted a couple things related to Stoicism. I haven't had a chance to go through them, but uh, it's just interesting stuff that you find. If you want to post it there, feel free to. Hey, uh, Synapsine, is there any way you can pin that blog post that I made? Um, yeah, I think we can. Been meaning to do that, but I didn't have the time. Everybody follow Patman on Minds. Yeah, you had a really impressive blog going on. I liked it. 
So, and if you want to invite people to this uh, Discord, Patman, feel free to. Will do. Cool. All right, so I guess that just about does it.